Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're here to tell you about the work we've been doing uh, to assist um, the University of Oldenburg and the what's called the Competence Centrum uh, for Hearing Aid Research in Germany. Um, and we're going to be telling you about uh, the sort of how we did it and the why. So, uh, can we have the first slide, please? So, um, we're from a, a small UK company called 64 Studio. Um, we uh, created uh, an AMD 64 based distro uh, for media production, so workstations essentially. And uh, what we did was we took the new AMD 64 port of uh, Debian, uh, we combined that with a real time kernel and a curated package selection. And we produced that distro from about sort of 2005, 2006. And um, pretty soon people got the idea that this was um, a worthwhile approach and the other distros started to take on uh, the idea of packaging a, a real-time kernel for desktop systems. So what do we do? Uh, well, we make, still make a custom Debian-based and Ubuntu-based distros uh, for x86, uh, AMD64, but now ARM as well. And uh, because we focus on audio performance, um, we do some uh, development work and debugging for um, audio systems, so sound cards, that kind of thing. And our, our target is to get the best possible audio latency from commodity hardware, uh, but also um, to make our tools available to everyone. So I, I'm Daniel. Um, I co-founded the company in 2005 with Free Econiaca, who um, was a developer on the Demudi distribution, the Debian multimedia distribution. And uh, we uh, built this initial distro together. Um, I also worked on Linux User and Developer Magazine, if any of you remember that from the 1990s. Um, and I've written a couple of books about um, uh, this sort of area. And I was doing a journalism uh, assignment, and I was talking to musicians who were adopting the AMD Opteron. This is about 2004. And I thought, this sounds like a really interesting uh, processor. What if we had a, a distribution that was um, you know, really targeted for this new hardware? making uh, the best use of this sort of new tech as it was at the time. And uh, that turned out to be uh, a good bet. And uh, that's how basically it started. So while Dan's writing these magazines and writing books, I handle the engineering. So originally I trained as an electronic engineer, but I also now do software with Linux. Um, just find it really fun and it's challenging, so why not? Um, I mean, really interested in projects like Linux and XE, um, upstreaming the all winner chips. Um, I've been hacking on Linux for a few years now, so yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, so, hearing aids. Well, um, obviously, hearing aids have a long history from the sort of picture in the middle here, sort of pure acoustic instruments, to the one on the left, which is a sort of familiar analog hearing aid, quite bulky. Um, quite limited, just a simple amplifier, essentially. Um, and on the right-hand side, we've got the, the sort of modern digital hearing aid, which is a, a tiny device that does a, a great deal more. Now, um, if you have a hearing aid which is just a simple acoustic amplifier, it will amplify everything, including the sounds that you don't want to hear, such as a fire engine going past while you're trying to have a conversation. So what digital hearing aids do is they take this, uh, this idea of an amplifier, and they turn it into more of a processing device that can filter audio and enhance it. So, um, obviously, we want sound to be audible to people who have hearing loss. There are many causes of hearing loss, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, like uh, traumatic hearing loss caused by loud noises, um, you know, disease and inherited hearing loss. Um, there's a wide range of devices uh, at different price levels. And as hearing aids become more sophisticated, they may need to be calibrated for individuals. And hearing aids uh, are a relatively um, underfunded area of research. Um, we uh, found the statistic of uh, just over a pound is spent um, per person in the UK um, per year on hearing aid uh, research and hearing research more generally. Um, and that is, um, you know, probably less than a tenth of the income uh, the, for um, sight loss research. Uh, but um, there is some evidence to suggest that um, hearing aids um, have all kinds of um, side benefits, one of which may be the um, uh, later onset of uh, dementia. Uh, because if people cannot hear, 
uh, what people are saying to them, it obviously is not going to help them. So um, what is a hearing aid? Well, it's one or more microphones, and we'll see later how multiple microphone hearing aids are, are now part of the sort of research that's being done. Um, you've got a processing circuit of some kind and an output. And of course, you, you need a battery to power this. So <clears throat> the analog hearing aid that we saw in the previous slide, um, not really sold anymore. Um, they can be bulky and uh, rather expensive for what they are. And it's, it's old tech, essentially. Um, the um, filter response is sort of baked in to that hardware. And it may be difficult to tailor for an individual. And then, of course, we have the other problem, which is that nowadays people have mobile phones, they have um, digital TVs and all kinds of other audio devices that need to be able to integrate uh, with these uh, hearing aids. And in the past, this was done by induction. So you would have a telephone pickup coil inside a hearing aid. Um, but obviously, we've got Bluetooth, we've got all kinds of other technologies nowadays. And people need to be able to take that phone call or listen to the TV um, and without you know, having to take the hearing aid in or out. So. Um, digital hearing aids are quite different. Um, the research in this area is quite um, uh, difficult to break into in that because the miniaturization involved is, um, is very expensive to do. Um, it's not um, necessarily something a small company can, can break into easily. Uh, so you tend to see the very large uh, companies involved spending a great deal of money on, on these, these projects. Um, the sort of Earlier generation digital hearing aids uh, may not be software upgradable. The algorithms may be baked into the hardware, in a sense. And that is obviously uh, less flexible. Um, the initial cost of these devices might be higher. And we have this latency issue. Um, if you um, sort of do more processing than the hearing aid can handle, we can introduce delay. And that would be somewhat like listening to a badly dubbed movie. Um, obviously, that's not a good thing uh, for a hearing aid. So it's a very latency-critical application. Um, you've got power issues, of course, battery life, all those kind of things. And then we've got the new generation devices like the Bluetooth devices, audio devices, and things like that that need to be integrated. So there are uh, commercial products beginning to break into this, this area, but they're not very hackable. They're not very easy to break into for these sort of small to medium-sized companies. So this is the things we're going to tackle. Um, <clears throat> the open MHA is the, the master hearing aid, uh, the sort of open master hearing aid. Um, this was um, established as part of this uh, competence center um, in, in Germany. Um, the University of Oldenburg has led this project in uh, partnership with commercial companies. And for, for some years, since about 2006, they've been developing this, this sort of open platform for hearing aid research. Uh, there's various uh, bits of software available. Um, obviously, it's uh, emphasizing the real-time aspect, um, so that's where the real-time Linux kernel comes in. And there are multiple algorithms that can be tested and evaluated. Um, it's not only the sort of the software that you put in the hearing aid, but it's also the relationship of that software to the hardware. So, for example, you can have multiple microphones per ear. You can um, set up a directional array so that the microphones are amplifying in front of the wearer rather than off to the side or, or behind that person. Um, you can use uh, beam forming techniques, which are also used in things like video conferencing microphones. So we're trying to uh, compare the time that sounds arrive at different microphones and use that to sort of focus the amplification on a certain spot, normally in front of the wearer. And these are more, more complex techniques that need more processing power. But what this project basically does is it gives all these different research groups and universities, different uh, companies around the world, uh, like a base platform that they can evaluate certain techniques or algorithms against. And as I mentioned, it's been going over a few years. So what happened initially? Well, um, at the time, we're talking sort of 12 or so years ago, um, <clears throat> the algorithms required running on something like a laptop or a PC. And the reason was that um, these are uh, algorithms which have not yet been optimized for the miniature hardware that you'll find in a hearing aid. And the reason for that is if you've got a research approach which may not be fruitful, 
It doesn't make sense to heavily optimize that for the miniature hardware um, before you're sure that it's actually a good technique, because you could waste a lot of time and money doing that. So was, this is more the sort of uh, what you would do in a lab. You, know, you'd, you would sit someone down and maybe expose them to some sounds and uh, get the feedback and uh, you know, adjust the, your, your techniques. And so it's sort of desk-based. Um, we'd typically be using uh, a uh, sort of USB device um, in, a, in a lab setting. And you'll see on top of the, the black box in the top right corner there, you've got the, the actual earpieces which fit um, behind the wearer's ears. And um, this is quite, quite CPU hungry stuff. So um, fast forward a decade or so, and we want to take those people out of the lab and into the wider world. Now there was a, a laptop based version, uh, which meant you put a ThinkPad in a backpack and you had the cables running out the backpack to the earpieces and you could send people out into the real world to test these hearing aids. Um, but of course, um, you would only get maybe a couple of hours of battery life um, doing this sort of quite intense um, audio processing, and then you'd have to return to base. So it's not the sort of thing that somebody could use in their daily life. Not, not too practical. But now um, we've got the um, single board computers. This is uh, BeagleBone Black, uh, the wireless version. And we will um, tell you more about that. Um, the, uh, SBCs based on mobile phone parts are relatively affordable uh, compared to the laptops that we used before. Um, they, of course, they're using a lot less power, so we can extend the battery life. And there are lots of uh, peripherals that we can add on to it, like this audio cape we'll be telling you about. Um, <clears throat> for some issues, um, there are some issues with um, these uh, devices. Um, if they um, don't have long uh, lifespans, um, we may not be able to have a standard base because this project wants to run over many years. So we need a, uh, a, a device with long availability, preferably open hardware, so we can make more if we need to. And uh, that's why this is a BeagleBone. So, so um, as you saw in the previous slide, um, there was a USB audio interface. Uh, but USB audio has a lot of extra stuff uh, that's um, sort of passing uh, down the wire that's not necessarily to do with audio, but um, just the overhead of USB itself. And so we, we want to use um, as little as possible in order to get that uh, low latency performance. So we're using the I2S uh, bus, which is on the, um, on the BeagleBone and on the uh, Raspberry Pi and other devices. The uh, Raspberry Pi only supports two channels of I2S. And if, if you're not familiar with I2S, it's the it's the sort of low-level protocol that was used in um, compact disc players. It was invented by Philips in the 1980s, and um, it's uh, very suitable for our purposes. But there's only, as I say, only two, two channels on the uh, I2S on the Raspberry Pi. And because we want to use multiple microphones per ear, we need more than two channels. So fortunately, the, the BeagleBone supports more. And this is in part because of home theater. Um, so you've got these um, chipsets which support eight channels or 16 channels of audio because they're designed for surround sound, essentially. So we're, we're appropriating that and misusing it for some completely different purpose. Um, so the Beagle Bone Black, um, it's a good balance of the features that we need. Um, as it says on the slide, it's uh, available, it's uh, reasonably priced, and um, it's sort of does what we need it to do. And the um, sort of development, because it's own open hardware, means that we can take it to produce our own device if we need to. And Texas Instruments actually very, very helpful um, on uh, specs and so on support. But um, it is getting rather old now as a design, and it's, uh, it's only a one gigahertz um, single core, and uh, we're doing intensive audio processing, so we, we're looking to the future to see what um, we can do instead. So Chris, would you like to tell us about this? So the board you can see in front of us is a development board from Analog Devices. Um, it's hooked up to the BeagleBone Black. And there's also some MEMS microphones on there, which are digital microphones. Um, there's also a speaker and some amplifiers. Now, obviously, that is very difficult to fit in a patient to send them out into the field. The wires will come off um, <laughs> and then be quite difficult to eventually come back together. So 
it was decided that it would be designed as a cape to fit on the beagle bone. Um, unfortunately, it's not available for purchase at the moment, but in the future, we're looking to make it available for purchase to others. So it's designed to be used with hearing aids and preamps that have already been created. So this is basically um, line in and line out. Um, three stereo microphone inputs and three, oh sorry, two stereo headphone outputs. Um, we've got an external micro SD storage as well as there's also EMMC storage on the BeagleBone Black itself. There's Bluetooth and wireless and also battery connections. And the final good thing about it is it's open source hardware and it's very cheap to produce. You want to take this one? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we generate our images using a tool called PDK, Platform Development Kit, um, which basically takes a Debian base and we can add our own packages in. <coughs> um, so we decided to add the BeagleBone support to that in the first case because we were familiar with our tool and how it works. We're also very familiar with Debian, aren't we? Um, so what we did in that case was we looked at the BeagleBone images that were out there already, and we basically copied what was in there, the layouts of the SD card, that sort of thing. Um, small U-boot scripts, small Debian packages for the Linux kernel and the U-boot. Um, then we used the bootstrap to make a de minimal Debian environment, and then we added some tools in as well. Then later on, we added in our custom packages. There's some links at the bottom if you want to find out more about PDK, but we won't be touching much on that in this presentation. Mm -hmm. So we created a small glue logic driver for the kernel just to explain to the system the codecs and how they're, how they're actually wired up into the BeagleBone Black, how the clocks are defined, that sort of thing, the I squared C addresses, that that sort of stuff. Um, after that, it was quite an easy job to get the audio in and the audio out, and we just tested it with the standard jack and ALSA tools. It just seemed to work fine. But then the problem came with the real-time performance. So I'm not sure how many milliseconds it is per foot. It's about a, a millisecond um, for every foot or 30 centimetres that you are from the thing that you're listening to. So 17 milliseconds of latency is quite high. And also our CPU usage was quite high. And this is basically just taking the input and dumping it to the output. So there's no processing in there at all. Um, with the preempt RT, we achieved four milliseconds latency at 20% CPU usage. And I think there's even scope for reducing that even further. Um, I'm quite happy with the result. And it was basically without any patches from us, just some careful configuration. So we used the Texas Instruments Linux kernel, um, which has already been patched with the preempt RT patch set. Um, it's also got some other patches in there for specific parts of the board. Um, also, it's got the serial dr port driver for the audio built in with the latest patches from Texas Instruments. Um, we found it a lot better than the mainline Linux in this case. Um, I know Texas Instruments are working hard to upstream all of that. Um, and you'll find that some vendor support is not as good as Texas Instruments or other Western manufacturers. Um, there's some Chinese manufacturers out there that aren't quite as helpful. Um, and we've also had that headache in other projects. So we're very grateful for the community and Texas Instruments for the help on that. So basically, a real-time kernel or a real-time system means that the system has to meet a deadline. Some people obviously confuse that with it being fast. That's not necessarily the case. Um, in most real-time applications, the deadline is like a life or death situation. So you're pressing the brakes on your car, the real-time system delays, and your car doesn't break. In our case, we don't really matter so much about that. All we care about is the speed of filling the buffers and clearing the buffers. So it's not that bad of a deal, is it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the worst that can happen is um, you send audio to the wrong channel um, through a channel skip, and you, mm. you in a home theatre system, you might um, blow up a subwoofer <laughs> or something like that. But uh, in a hearing aid, uh, we haven't encountered that problem yet. So. 
So there's a lot of patience required to do this, a lot of iterations needed. I think it was a couple of days of my time to actually get this all working well. Um, but now we've done it, I'm very happy with the performance. So we did actually find someone a while back that was asking us about how to tune a real-time system. Mm -hmm. And they thought just because they've got a real-time kernel on the system, it's going to be much better. There's a lot of tweaking, a lot of things you need to do. Um, I've explained that on the slides. So, we try to run through some of those points just to explain them. So yeah, yeah. So the first step, obviously, is to make sure your system is real-time. So using the cyclic test, you can. You, find out whether your system really is real-time or not. If it's not real-time, obviously go back to the drawing board and apply the patches properly. Um, in the file proc interrupts, there is the IRQs. Um, in there, you can find the sound card DMA and then increase the priority of that high, but that's got to be higher than your application. So in our case, we're using Jack Audio Server, and that's got to be below the priority of the sound card. And then after that, hopefully, it should just work. Um, <laughs> make it sound quite easy, but we spent a lot of time and effort in the past mm -hmm. to do this, haven't we? Mm. So what we done was we created a system based off of Debian. Um, our customer liked that because they sort of use Ubuntu and Debian in their labs anyway. So it was just a natural selection choice to use Debian and make our own distribution around it. We could have done something like Yocto or Buildroot, but really we've got the tools to mm. make Debian-based images, so we thought we'd do that. Um, normally our systems are built up of 99% Debian packages, and we've got our own custom packages on top, like the application, the kernel, um, and U-boot, things like that. So basically we just copied one of our distros, put some scripts on there to set the sound card up and set all the priorities up, mm. um, installed OpenMHA, the package, and all the configuration files for that, and just tweaked the system. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that um, for a research and development platform, the requirements of the end users are quite different from a consumer application. Um, our end users are um, sort of researchers, scientists, um, people who work in labs. Um, they want the ability to um, install additional packages um, on the target system um, in much the same way that they would install them on their development workstation. Um, they don't want to have to um, flash the whole system um, to um, you know, install an extra um, tool for maybe compiling a package or some extra audio um, filters or, or something like that. So they appreciated the um, benefits of running a, a full Debian um, on this little thing so that they could um, treat it much like that workstation or laptop they're used to working on. So um, that sort of suggested a more um, sort of standard Debian approach than a more embedded approach where um, you, know, you might be delivering a complete um, system image and then just flashing it over the top. So that's one of the reasons for that, that design decision. So in the end, that created a system that we call Mahalia. It was named after a singer, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. All our projects are named after musicians. So this is um, named after Mahalia Jackson, um, the gospel singer, and also because her name had M, H, and A in that order. So it's a kind of a code name. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, um, that's what that is. It's basically a, a distro that's set up um, to um, run the programs that the researchers need, um, sort of straight out of the box. So the programs that a run as well include a Wi-Fi hotspot. It's a very simple hotspot. We've also appended the serial number to the end of the hotspot name because mm. it can get quite complicated if you've got a number of these boards running. You don't know which one's which. Yeah. Um, I also wrote a Bluetooth low energy peripheral in Node.js using Bleno, um, which allows you to control the device from your phone to set up different filter parameters. Um, the system can be flashed to an SD card, just as way that you would do any other image, but it can also be flashed to the internal MMC on the device just by pressing a button on boot. So it's got all of that built in so the user can mm. just pick it up and go. Um, I'm working very hard at the moment to, to release the instructions on how to build your own system with PDK. 
Mm. Um, that's hopefully going to become around at the end of this year, early next year. So I look forward to that. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that the, uh, one of the key things for the lab that uses these things is um, the idea that they can save um, researcher time in doing those routine sort of system administration tasks, like setting up these devices from scratch, for example, um, using like a, a stock Debian would take many hours of tweaking and fiddling. And so for their researchers, if they can um, save time in the lab, that's more time they can spend on research. But it also means that um, we can um, send this distro out to the, the sort of general public, the interested people around the world. Um, we could also get up and running to test these things independently. So the main problem with this board is the CPU is quite slow. Um, We've seen a lot of system on chips recently coming out of China and the likes that are really cheap and they've got a lot of processing power in them. So hopefully we're looking next at using the all winner chips. Um, mm. I think we're looking at mm. the H6 because that's got 16 channels. Um, hopefully we can start writing a driver for the TDM on that and build the same thing on another system. Yep, and there is, there is a port of um, this um, software to the Raspberry Pi. Um, as I mentioned, it only has two channels of I2S. Um, but you can use that um, with uh, binaural headphones. So these are little earbud uh, headphones that have a, a microphone in each ear um, for a simpler stereo version. So if someone was looking to get into this area of research, um, that is a very affordable way to do that. And there are um, instructions up on GitHub for the uh, Raspberry Pi version. Um, even if, um, if, as I say, it's only two channels, but that may be enough to get people started in this area of research. And the, um, the University of Oldenburg is very interested in um, having more people um, test this stuff, contribute to it, um, you know, uh, and just look at the area of hearing aid development in general. Uh, because with um, an aging demographic in many countries, it's a, it's a really big uh, market opportunity uh, for people who are interested in commercial development. But it's also a very um, sort of worthwhile uh, area of research for sort of humanitarian development as well. As we've seen, the, there are many benefits to um, being able to improve people's hearing. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, we put all the uh, trademark disclaimers up there. <laughs> of course, we, you know, we didn't make uh, the Linux kernel. You know, we just use it. Um, and uh, John Magdog Hall would be very pleased to hear that it is a trademark of Linus Torvalds. Um, so, uh, if there are any questions, please uh, do come to the mics. There's one over there and one over there. Oh, we've also got a demo of the system tonight. That's true. In the yeah. technical showcase, which is happening in the foyer uh, by the registration desk um, this evening. Um, so uh, please, yeah, please do um, come along to that and ask us more questions about the specifics of this thing, if you would like. Bring your own hearing aids. Hello, we have a couple Hi. of questions over here. Yes. Hi. Uh, great talk. Um, a general question. The, mm -hmm. the manufacturers that produce the more expensive hearing aids with their algorithms where people have to Mm -hmm. go back every three months to have it reset. Have they contacted you? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, this, the um, University of Oldenburg does work with the industry, uh, but the um, R&D that they are doing is for the, like, the next generation of hearing aids. Yeah. So um, there's a, a, a sort of spin-off from the university which works directly with the commercial partners, and uh, they are very interested, obviously, in um, making this R&D more accessible and more uh, sort of easily tested in the field. Because you know, the next um, brilliant algorithm for hearing aid from it could come from potentially anywhere. You know, it could come from uh, somebody who's you know, not even working in a university. Um, if they can maybe download some of the stuff, run it on a Raspberry Pi, and come up with some sort of genius uh, you know, sort of uh, innovation, that could come from anywhere. And that's really what the whole project is about, is opening up the access to outside of these uh, these sort of small R&D teams. Thank you. Thank you. Why is long-term availability important for you? Isn't the only requirement really that the form factor, so the, the thing you can plug the cape on, is long-term available? Well, really, we want the system to be available for over 10 years. Um, we want the exact same system, really, to be available to the different researchers, because their research may take a long time to finish, and you've got to have the hardware available over that time for their thesis and things to be accepted. And so why does it have to be the same 
exact same hardware, why can't it be a newer generation of the uh, of something well, it, that does it, the, it, it the could, same functionality? Yeah. I understand. Um, it could be, yeah. And we're constantly looking to improve that, but it's got to be available just in case we don't want to go back and try it on those older boards. Yeah, I mean, so, some, of the, some of the Chinese boards, which are really um, high performance, um, they, they make a million of them, and then they don't make any more, and then you can't get them anymore. So um, at least with um, open hardware, um, it may be an older design, but you know that design is going to be available for you to fab some more if you have to in uh, a number of years' time. And also, um, another really pertinent thing is the, the custom audio hardware. So if you make this custom audio board and you have a design and it works really well, um, it interfaces with this BeagleBone Black. It may not work with the next generation of whatever other wonder board is out there. Yeah, so that's it's why also I about said the peripherals. It's, it's really the cape interface that has to be long-term available, yeah, not absolutely. so much the BeagleBone itself or whatever mm. yeah. baseboard you need. No, we love the BeagleBone. It, it's great. Um, and part of it is because of the open hardware and the long-term availability. I'm sure there are other boards that will um, you know, come along. Um, as I say, at the moment, the Raspberry Pi is a little bit limited um, in terms of channel count, um, but I'm sure there'll be a future device from the Raspberry Pi Foundation which um, you know, addresses those issues. Uh, were you considering DSP options or FPGA-based uh, boards? For example, there are boards around also $100, like Beagle, mm -hmm. Beaglebone, and mm -hmm. uh, for example, you can use uh, either a combination of ARM ARM core or use just fully like soft processor, like microblaze or? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the whole point of this device is to avoid premature optimization. So it's all host-based software processing. Um, so as I said before, if um, there's a new algorithm and it doesn't turn out to be that good, um, then at least um, they've avoided the effort involved in, in sort of making that hardware. And so there are many, many different techniques um, using multiple microphones. Um, different kinds of uh, dynamic compression, filtering, all this kind of thing. And the idea is to give that, that same host-based environment that you would have when you're working on a workstation, but in a, in a portable uh, device. So, yeah, I mean, for sure the uh, manufacturers will be doing all that DSP work um, when it comes to the actual thing that you will put in your ear as a retail product. Uh, but um, for, for research, it's, it's all about the, the software. Yeah, yeah, I see. Thank you. Thank you. So, are there any other questions? There's one, one over here. Hiya. Um, I see you using the BeagleBone Black. Mm -hmm. It's well known for having the PIU coprocessors. Um, yeah. I was wondering if there's any reason you didn't just use normal Linux plus some real-time processors on the coprocessors, the PIUs. Well, I think the coprocessor is actually very small and you couldn't run these filters on there. I'm not sure exactly whether the I2S peripheral is available on there. I'll have to check that out and... It doesn't have I2S, but yeah, it's just a, yeah, real time. Yeah, I think that's mainly for a lot lower level, like a few hundred lines of C code rather than right. yeah, I mean, full filters and things. Some of the audio filters that run basically use every drop of CPU that's available. They're quite intense. And because I say they're not, they're not optimized, uh, particularly, it's more like um, early stages research. So it's more like they uh, went for the... Um, the, the, the sort of the full power option rather than the, the efficient option. Yes, yeah, so you've got a software um, v version of uh, something that would be running optimized on a DSP. Yeah. And that's mm. why it's, yeah, very high power. And um, as I mentioned, um, the idea is to translate what these people have been doing on their workstations and their laptops right. directly onto the BeagleBone without having anything that's too specific um, to the device itself. So, for example, the, um, the audio interface is um, a standard ALSA interface and it appears to um, the Jack server uh, like just a regular sound card in a PC. So there's no sort of special trickery around the sort of um, embedded hardware. And so it's all keeping it very, very standard and very translatable across different um, uh, work that, um, you know, different machines that people might be using for this work. Cool. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, if, um, if that's all the questions, I'll say uh, thank you very much for coming and please do come and see us at the technical showcase. Thank you.